Act One of In Chancery by Arthur Wing Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Characters Captain Dionysius McCafferty, formerly in the Ballyterra Militia, now proprietor of the Railway Hotel, Steepleton Junction. Read by Larry Wilson. Dr. Titus, his medical attendant. Read by Stephen Fellows. Montague Joldeeth. Read by Todd. Mr. Hinksman. Read by Alan Mapstone. John, Mrs. Smith's servant. Read by Thomas Peter. Mr. Buzzard, a butcher. Read by Adrian Stevens. Mr. Gorge, a draper. Read by Son of the Exiles. Mrs. Smith, read by Sonia. Mrs. Marmaduke Jackson, read by T. J. Burns. Patricia McCafferty, read by phone. Amelia Ann Buzzard, read by Leanne Yao. Walker, Mrs. Smith's servant, read by Devora Allen. Kittles, read by Eva Davis. Stage Directions, read by Michael Max. In Chancery Act I. Drawing a Blank The Parlour of the Railway Hotel at Steepleton Junction Act Two, Artificial Memory The Best Room in the Hotel Act Three, Home Sweet Home Sitting Room at Mrs. Marmaduke Jackson's Gravesend Three Sundays elapse between Acts 1 and 2. Act 2 occurs on the morning and Act 3 on the evening of the same day. In Chancery Act 1. Drawing a Blank Scene The comfortable parlour of a small hotel. Upstage right, door leading to bar. Upstage left, door with passage backing. At back, large window or windows, looking onto a country prospect with a railway, telegraph wires, etc. Upstage at back, two small tables of equal size. Round table, right centre. Three chairs, round table, left centre. Two chairs placed as in plan. Downstage left, fireplace. Above fireplace, armchair. Below fireplace, an ordinary chair. Downstage right, sideboard with crockery, plate, etc. On sideboard, a work basket with needlework. By sideboard, a chair or stool. On table right centre, a cribbage board and cards, long clay pipes, matches and a newspaper. On table left centre, Pipes, newspapers and matches. The room generally furnished with all the characteristics of an inn parlour. Stuffed birds, fishing rods and basket, a gun or two, sporting pictures, etc. Short, lively music at opening. As the curtain rises, the angry voice of McCafferty, accompanied by a small crash of broken crockery, is heard in the distance, off left. Patricia enters door right, listening. Patricia is a buxom, brawny, Irish woman, neatly dressed, but with a wild head of red hair. My pa's in a queer temper by the sound of it. She crosses to door left and listens. McCafferty's voice rises higher. There now, he's arguing in politics with poor Mr. Jolliffe. Looking towards door right. Thank goodness. Here's the gentleman arriving. Mr. Gorge enters door right. He is a thin man, almost entirely bald, with a treble voice. Mr. Gorge, politely. Good evening, Miss McCafferty. Rubbing his hands heartily. Any news, eh? Any news? Good evening to you, Mr. Gorge. There's nothing stirring. 
How's Captain McCafferty tonight? There is another crash off left. Mr. Gorge's manner changes to extreme timidity. Patricia jerking her head towards the left. I think he's just having a chat with Mr. Jolliffe, the gentleman stopping in the hotel. Oh. Mr. Gorge goes up to table left centre, very quietly and nervously, and sits behind the table. Uh-huh, yes, I'll take my usual, Miss McCafferty. Patricia crosses to right centre as Mr. Buzzard enters door right. Mr. Buzzard is a fat, red-faced man with bushy hair and gruff voice, the reverse of Mr. Gorge. Mr. Buzzard, jovially. Good evening, Miss McCafferty. Good evening, Mr. Gouge. Good evening, Good evening Mr. Mr. Buzzard. Buzzard. Any news, eh? Any news? I believe not, sir. How is your poor papa tonight? Another distinct crash. Mr. Buzzard's face changes. He stands rooted to the spot. He's just having a little bit of a chat with Mr. Jolliffe, the gentleman stopping in the hotel. Mr. Buzzard, nervously. Oh, I think I'll take my usual, Miss McCafferty. Patricia goes out door right. Mr. Buzzard tiptoes up to the table right centre and sits behind it. He and Mr. Gorge load their long pipes gloomily. Captain seems a little worse than ordinary tonight, Mr. Buzzard, sir. He do, he do. Time Dr. Titus was here to keep him under. Mr. Gorge, looking towards door. Here is the doctor. Dr. Titus enters door right. He is a middle-aged, professional-looking person with iron-grey hair and whiskers. His attire is rather inclined to seediness, his manner pompous and bombastic. Good evening, gentlemen. Crosses left and puts hat on mantelpiece. Good, Good evening, evening doctor. doctor. Good evening. Good evening. Titus, bustling over to armchair. How is Captain McCafferty tonight? Mr. McCafferty's voice heard outside. He's upstairs. With Mr. Jolliffe. The gentleman's staying in the hotel. Having, Having a, a little, little bit, bit of, of a chat. chat. Oh, quite so, quite so. Patricia enters door right, carrying tray with glasses, etc. She gives Mr. Gorge and Mr. Buzzard their drinks. You're single-handed tonight, Miss McCafferty. Where's the waiter? He contradicted Papa this afternoon. Oh. oh. So Papa dismissed him through the window. Oh. I'm so glad you've come, Doctor. And is it whiskey you'll take? It is whiskey. Irish? Any whiskey would become Irish when dispensed by your fair hands. Go on, now. Goes out door right. Mr. Gorge and Mr. Buzzard light their pipes. This excitement is very bad for the captain, ain't it, Doctor? Very, very. You might tell us how Captain McCafferty's ailment came about, Doctor, if it's no secret. Titus, standing on hearthrug, left centre. Certainly. My friend, I may say our friend, our host of the railway hotel at Steepleton, was formerly a captain in the distinguished Ballytara militia. One of his brother officers, who was also a cheesemonger, thought it wise upon one occasion to wink at Mrs. McCafferty, the captain's wife, now, alas, beyond the reach of all such advances. Dear me. Indeed. Captain McCafferty, always, shall I say, a hasty man, dragged the offender to Belgium, where they fought a duel with pistols. Good, Good gracious. gracious! I was the medical man concerned. In the result, the captain spoiled his opponent's new hat, while the cheesemonger contrived to lodge a bullet in the captain's body. Mercy me! Well, I never. Now, gentlemen, the whereabouts of that bullet has never been discovered. If it is still in Captain McCafferty's body, I say if that bullet is still in Captain McCafferty's body, the slightest excitement such as would be produced by thwarting a fond wish or upsetting a cherished project, the slightest excitement might produce the most alarming results. Gentlemen, it is a most interesting case. Mr. Gorge and Mr. Buzzard wipe their foreheads nervously. Most interesting, most interesting. 
Then you remain in Stupleton, Doctor, expressly to look after the Captain. Ahem. <clears throat> Captain McCafferty is good enough to appoint me his medical attendant. You're watching for the bullet, eh? I am watching for the bullet. And if the bullet is ever discovered, you'll lose a very comfortable post, eh, Doctor? Gets up and takes light from table, right centre. Titus, drawing himself up. Mr. Gorge. I beg your pardon, Doctor. No offence. Mr. Gorge and Mr. Buzzard talk together. Dr. Titus turns from them and slyly produces a pocket book from which he takes out a small leaden bullet. Titus, aside, weighing the bullet in his hand. But the bullet isn't likely to be discovered while it's in Bob Titus's pocket book. He returns bullet to the pocket book and pocket book to his pocket. Aside. Ahem, it's a most interesting case. Patricia enters door right, carrying tumbler of drink, which she gives to Titus. Here you are, Doctor. Another distant crash is heard, with McCafferty's voice above it. Keep your eyes on Pa, Doctor. If he loses his temper, he's done entirely. McCafferty, outside. What do you mean, Mr. Joliffe, sir, by regarding me in that manner? With your eye, you're wearing an impertinent look, sir. He's coming. There is a general movement. The two men at the table bury their heads in their papers. Titus sits in chair below fireplace left. Patricia runs to right centre and sits, taking needlework from basket on sideboard. Captain Dionysius McCafferty, with his hands in his pockets, rushes in from door left. He is a fat, untidily dressed old man, with fiery face, red whiskers and bushy hair. His eyes are bolting from their sockets, and he is trembling with passion. He looks round fiercely, as if seeking some excuse for an outburst. Finding none, he sinks into chair centre. I wish you a very good evening to all of ye. Mr. Gorge, in a small voice, over his paper. Good evening, Captain McCafferty. McCafferty turns upon him suddenly. Mr. Gorge disappears behind his newspaper. Mr. Buzzard, over his paper. Delighted to see you, Captain. McCafferty glares at him. He disappears like Mr. Gorge. McCafferty to Patricia. What are you doing, Pat, my darling? Mending the white waistcoat you tore up when you were a little put out last night. You've been agitating yourself again, Captain McCafferty. No, I've not. Mr. Joliffe agitated me. Dear me, how? He contradicted my assertion. Oh, I'm sure you're mistaken, Papa. What did Mr. Joliffe say? He didn't say anything. He regarded me in a contradictory manner with his eye. I'll speak to Mr. Joliffe. He'll explain everything satisfactorily. I'll be bound. Goes to door, opens it, and calls. Mr. Joliffe? Mr. Joliffe? Joliffe, in distance. Yes? Step down and join us in the parlour, will you? Oh, yes, certainly. Titus returns to his seat before fire left as Montague Jolliffe enters. He is a fair-haired individual, with a pale, anxious face, roving eyes and a large expanse of forehead. Jolliffe, as he enters. Delighted to make one, delighted to make one. Good evening. Captain McCafferty is under the mistaken impression, Mr. Jolliffe, that you contradicted some assertion he made. Ah, uh, no, I'm sure Mr. Jolliffe didn't, did you, Mr. Jolliffe? Jolliffe shakes his head. No, he contradicted me with a look of his eye. Quite a mistake, quite a mistake. Captain McCafferty expressed his conviction that Steepleton, which at present boasts 98 inhabitants, a hotel and a railway station, would in a short space of time become the centre of British commerce, with a mayor a town council, and a bishopric. In reply, I merely said, Oh. McCafferty, rising. But you looked dubious, sir. 
knowing the precarious state of my health, you looked dubious. Well, I assure you, Captain McCafferty, I didn't mean to. Ah, very well, then. I accept your apology. Say no more. But I assure... Say no more. No, I can assure you... Say no more. Turning to Gorge and Buzzard. Gentlemen, we'll play with the cards. Well, Captain McCafferty, if I might suggest... Keep silence, or when I make a proposal. Turning to Gorge. We'll play three-handed crib. Mr. Gorge moves timidly to chair at back of table, right centre. Mr. Buzzard to right of same table. They sit playing at table, right centre. Patricia sits doing her needlework and watching them, right. Jolliffe sinks into chair, left centre, facing Titus. What a dreadful person. Titus, drawing nearer to Jolliffe. Mr. Jolliffe, you'll pardon my freedom, I hope, but will you allow me to put to you one little question? Certainly. What is it? Now that you are completely recovered from your unfortunate railway accident, why do you remain in this wretched little town, in this equally wretched little inn, under the tyrannic rule of that despotic old ruffian? Why? Ah? With a poor devil of a doctor without a practice, it's different. I'm chained to Steepleton in attendance on old McCafferty. But you, you're a free man. Why not be up and away? Jolliffe draws himself up and takes Titus by the sleeve and looks round mysteriously. Up and away? Where to? To your relatives. Where are they? Well, then, to your friends. Where are they? Oh, dear, oh, dear. Well, then, to the town where you reside. What town? Confound it, man. Why don't you return to the place you came from? Where's that? Why, you never mean to say you don't know. Beckons to Titus to come nearer. Can I trust you, I wonder? That depends. Are you a tailor? I don't know. I mean, will you keep my secret? A most awful, harrowing secret. My dear sir, I'm a doctor, of course I will. Your word of honour? My word of honour. I've been longing for a confidant. Sit down. They sit close together, left centre. McCafferty, playing upstage violently. What do you mean, sir? What do you mean? Well, Captain, I was thinking... Ah, <sighs> to the devil with your thinking. Papa, Papa, keep calm. Gentlemen, gentlemen, don't agitate the Captain. He corrected my Captain. Knowing the precarious state of my health, too, with a bullet in me, he corrected my counten. Well, well, I apologize. So do I. Go on with the amusement, then, ye couple of blundering ignoramuses. They resume playing. What a dreadful person. What a dreadful person. Now, Mr. Jolliffe, I'm your servant. Soft music in orchestra. Dr. Titus, you remember my being brought to the railway inn at Steepleton, don't you? Of course I do, six weeks ago. Six weeks at Steepleton Junction. Turning and pointing. You can see the exact spot from that window. Two passenger trains came into violent collision. Nothing resulted but a few scratches and bruises and... Everybody was able, after a trifling delay, to resume their journey. Everybody with one important exception. Yourself? Myself. I was carefully deposited in the best bedroom of the railway hotel, where, owing to the assiduous nursing of that kind creature there, pointing to Patricia, and the unremitting attention of Dr. Titus, taking Titus's hand. In three weeks, I was on my legs again. As strong as a horse. Strong as a tandem. Never was better. At least I don't think I ever was better. But, Dr. Titus, I don't remember. Don't remember? No. I'm vigorous and hearty. 
can eat, drink, and sleep, I am well educated, can speak French, jabber a little German, know a phrase or two of Italian, and have a fair knowledge of music. But, Dr. Titus, ever since that little smash-up at Steepleton Junction, I haven't the least idea who the devil I am, whence I came, or where I'm going. Good gracious, what's wrong? Music stops. My memory. My mind's a perfect blank as to the past. Every incident of, I hope, my distinguished career previous to that railway accident has entirely left me. But you know your name. Jolliffe, producing card case. Yes, but only through finding my card case in my overcoat pocket. Handing card to Titus. Here it is, Montague Jolliffe. No address. MJ number 36 was marked on my collars, which leads me to hope I am a gentleman. Why? Well, nobody but a gentleman would have 36 white three-fold linen masher collars. Well, this is another most interesting case. Have you searched all the directories? Jolliffe, with a look of horror. No. Why not? I'm afraid to. Nonsense. Do it at once. Rises. No, no, no. I might turn out to be a party I don't like. I might have to follow a trade or profession I detest. Or, what is more awful, I might discover my profession without remembering how to practice it. I might find myself a colonel who has forgotten his drill, a captain in the navy who knows nothing but how to be seasick, or a doctor who cannot remember the pharmacopoeia. In short, I may be a soldier, sailor, apothecary, ploughboy, or a thief. Ah, but on the other hand... On the other hand, I may be the hero of the hour, the author of the latest craze in books, the new drawing-room tenor, or the fashionable tragedian. I may be an MP, one of the cabinet, or perhaps a member of the county court. It's this that buoys me up. But, Dr. Titus... I shan't be able to stand the uncertainty much longer. Give me your opinion. He rises and puts himself in studied position. Now, what do you think I am? Titus, sitting, leaning back and surveying him. A very lucky fellow. Lucky? Certainly. Why, it's as much as I can do to forget a few tradesmen's bills. You want my advice? Yes. Take it easy. Accept your position. You'll never have so little anxiety as you have at the present moment. How old are you? Don't know. What do you think? Think I'm a chicken? Well, you're in the prime of life, with no conscience to prick you on the score of past misdeeds. Enjoy yourself, make merry until your recollections return. Rises. Business with chair. Oh, they will return then? Of course they will, all of a sudden. Your case is no rarer in the annals of medicine than it is in fiction. When those two railway engines came together, you experienced a shock? I did. That's the cause. Music as before. One day without a moment's warning, like the bursting of a soap bubble in a man's ear, your memory will come back to you. The sight of somebody's ugly face, the sound of a familiar voice, the melody of a miserable comic song, or the air of a waltz from a discordant organ and the rusty gates of the past will be opened. Like a flash of lightning, you will regain the consciousness of cares and responsibilities, arrears of income tax unpaid, and all the evils of a well-spent life. Be warned, don't seek to hasten matters, and in the meantime, be happy. Music ceases. Happy? When I'm thrown a foundling on the mercy of that violent old Captain McCafferty? Dr. Titus, he's a demon... Well, he's a beast, but he's taken a fancy to you. But I've no money. Don't ask for his bill. But suppose he does. Then fly to her. Her? My good sir, you're blind. Haven't you discovered? What? Miss McCafferty, Patricia, your devoted nurse, she's lost her heart to you. You don't say so. I do, you lucky devil. 
No past and a nice, comfortable, snug future. How I envy you. I tell ye, I have not lost the game. Well, but Captain McCaffrey... Then some of ye have been putting my pegs back. No, no Captain, Captain, no. no. Putting my pegs back, and me in a delicate state of health. Titus, joining group at back. Gentlemen, gentlemen, don't agitate the captain. Jolliffe has seated himself in armchair left centre. Patricia crosses from right and stands behind his chair. I find you're beginning to look, Mr Jolliffe, dear. Am I, Miss McCafferty? I've done with the Miss McCafferty. My name's Patricia, and that's the short for it. Sure, I haven't fed John good calf's foot jelly, you at one end of the spoon and me at the other, to be called Miss McCafferty, now that you can feed without me. Titus was right. To Patricia. I'm very much obliged, Miss McCa- uh, Patricia. Patricia, smoothing his hair. I combed your hair in the middle when I had the dressing of it, and pretty you looked. I suppose I shall never have the combing of it again, at all, at all. Sits right. Jolliffe, aside. I should think Titus was right. Titus, going. Gentlemen, who will join in a game of pyramids upstairs? I will. So will I. Captain? No, I've got a little private affair to talk over with Mr. Jolliffe. Titus, Gorge and Buzzard go off door left. Jolliffe rises and is about to sneak away quietly. I think I'll make one, Doctor. I think I'll make one. McCafferty takes his arm and brings him back. Didn't you hear me say I'd got a little business with ye? Beg pardon, beg pardon. Business is a pleasure. Eh? I said business is a pleasure. McCafferty, pointing to chair. Sit down, then. Jolliffe sits nervously. Patricia, my darling, retire to the bar till I call ye. Patricia rises and crosses to right. McCafferty detains her and embraces her, wiping his eyes with emotion. Ah, my little girl, is the time coming when I've to share ye with another man? Go, darling. Patricia goes out, door right. Jolliffe, aside. I've a presentiment something dreadful is going to happen. McCafferty, turning to Jolliffe. Mr. Montague Jolliffe, sir. You've been with us, an occupant of the best bedroom at this hotel, six weeks come yesterday. You were brought here flat on the broad of your back, bruised and battered. You've been nursed by my own daughter, and physicked by my own doctor, and have enjoyed all the advantages of my own personal society. I'm sure I can never express my deep sense. Don't try sore when I'm in the middle of speaking. Kindness is my disposition. He goes to the sideboard, is watched anxiously by Jolliffe, and from a drawer takes out a number of long sheets of paper, closely written upon and fastened together in one corner. On paper, sir, in plain pounds, shillings and pence, your visit to this establishment takes that figure. Handing paper to Jolliffe. Mr. Jolliffe, your bill, sir. Jolliffe takes bill with a look of horror. McCafferty goes up to table, right centre, and puts cards, etc., in drawer. Jolliffe, aside. I was right. I was right. Something dreadful has happened. Turning over the sheets, one by one. First week. Oh, second week. Gracious. Third week. Goodness. Fourth week, nourishing food. Oh, Christopher. Fifth week, wine. Oh, Columbus. Sixth week, delicacies out of season. Oh, eh, oh. He collapses. McCafferty, standing over him. What the devil's the meaning of the zoological sounds you are emitting, sir? Are you delighted with the moderation of your little account, or are ye not? Jolliffe, recovering. Oh, delighted, delighted, Captain McCafferty. 
Are you quite sure nothing has been left out? Turning over leaves. Where's the pennyworth of periwinkles I had for tea yesterday? McCafferty snatches the bill from him and examines it violently. How dare you give me a turn and me in a delicate state of health? Returning bill and pointing out an item. There it is before you. Oh, of course. Reading. Periwinkles, half a crown. Thank you. You haven't charged with a pin. No, sir. Jolliffe tries unsuccessfully to cram the account into his pocket, holding them out to McCafferty. There isn't a lift in the hotel to take them up to my floor, is there? No, sir. Stop. I ought to tell you we take off two and a half percent to commercial travellers. Are you a commercial traveller? Jolliffe, rising aghast. Am I a what? A commercial traveller. Uh, no, I, I don't think so. You don't think so? I mean, I don't remember being a commercial traveller. You don't remember? Just so, just so. Of course, if a man is a commercial traveller, the chances are ten to one he knows it, aren't they? Why, certainly, sir. Just so, just so. That's what I want to get at. No, I don't think of taking off two and a half percent. Then, Mr. Jolliffe, if you're not a commercial traveller, what the devil are you? Jolliffe, his jaw dropping. Eh, uh, what am I? What are ye? What, uh, hold this for a moment, will you? It's rather heavy. Jolliffe who has been nursing the bundle of papers like a baby, deposits it in the captain's arms, wiping his brow. Yes, of course. What am I? Yes, sir. What are you? What am I? Yes, sir. What are you? Oh, I'm, um... I'm a gentleman. A gentleman? Ah, uh -huh. well, I'm glad of that. Shaking Jolliffe's hand. There's two of us. Now we shall get at what I'm driving at. You come of a good family, I take it. Oh, yes, the, the, the Jolliffes. Oh, the Jolliffes. Yes, the old Jolliffes, the good old Jolliffes. London boys? Well, they're spread about. They're spread about some, some here, some there. Are they rich? No, that's the devil of it. Putting hands into pockets. All the Jolliffe I know is a pauper. I mean, all the Jolliffes I know are paupers. Fine, well-made, strapping fellows, but no money. No money. And you? Oh, I'm a regular Jolliffe. McCafferty, returning the bundle of papers quickly. Take your bill now, sir. I've a communication to make to ye. Be seated. They sit. Jolliffe left centre. McCafferty brings chair centre. Jolliffe aside. Something else is going to happen. Mr. Montague Jolliffe, you may have heard, sir, that I'm a man in a precarious state of health, with a bullet in me somewhere or other, and where it is the devil only knows, or the doctor does not. Yes, I've heard that once or twice before. Ye may have heard also that the slightest agitation or excitement may make an angel of me. Well, I'm not prepared to pledge. None of your dirty, dubious looks, sir. Yes or no? Yes. Very well, then. Now, sir, I'm desirous of settling the future of this wonderful property the Steepleton Railway Hotel, by way of selecting a gentleman to succeed the present proprietor now before ye. And so, after looking on all sides of me, my choice has fallen upon you. But, Captain McCafferty, I've no capital. Stop, uh, I'm coming to that. Are you? I'm glad of that. I don't deny that I should have preferred ye with capital, but as you're a pauper... I must take ye as ye are. Jolliffe, attempting to rise. 
But, Captain McCafferty... McCafferty, pushing him back. Sit down, Mr. Joliffe, sir. You may have observed that my little girl has taken a strong liking for ye. Your little girl? Ah, my daughter, Patricia. Really, Captain, I don't think... Rising. Don't contradict me, sir. When you know the doctor forbids it. I say, sir, that my little girl is pining for ye. Why, sir, she's the shadow of what she was a month ago. You don't say so. But I do say so. Excitedly slapping his knees at each sentence. And I say, sir, that Dionysius McCafferty has made up his mind that the band shall go up next Sunday for your wedding with the best girl that ever drew breath in the parlor or beer in the bar. Rising. Give me your hand, Mr. Joliffe. You're in luck, sir. Puts chair back right. Jolliffe, rising. But, Captain McCafferty... McCafferty, turning. Well, sir... Suppose I've got a wife already. What? Suppose I've got a wife already. McCafferty, in a rage. What do you mean to say? You've crawled into my house and stolen the heart of my little girl, whilst you've got a wife waiting for your homecoming? Jolliffe, alarmed. Don't excite yourself, Captain. Don't excite yourself. Think of the bullet. McCafferty, sinking into chair right. Ah, Viper. You've done for me, Viper. Captain McCafferty, don't excite yourself. I didn't say I was married. McCafferty groans. On the contrary, I don't think I am married. Ah, what do you mean, you blackguard? I mean I don't remember ever marrying anybody. McCafferty, jumping up. Don't remember? You see, if a man is married, the chances are ten to one he knows it, ain't they? When I was married, I knew it. Uh, just so, just so. That's what I want to get at. That's what I want to get at. <sighs> what a shock you gave me. Bless you, my boy. I'll call my little girl, and you shall make her a happy creature with the good news. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. McCafferty goes to door right, opens it, and calls. Patricia, uh, Pat, uh, come here. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Oh, if I could only remember. Patricia enters door right. McCafferty embraces her. Pat, my darling, the blow has dropped on me. I've got to share ye with another man. Go to him, and there he stands, your own lawful husband that is to be. Patricia crosses to Jolliffe, bashfully. Montague! But, but, Patricia! They embrace. Ah, then, I shall comb your hair again for you after all. She leads him over to right, she sitting. McCafferty goes to door left and calls. Doctor, come down. Mr. Gorge, Mr. Buzzard, sirs, come down. Titus, Gorge, and Buzzard enter quickly. Well, Captain, well, Captain, well, Captain what is it? Mr. Jolliffe has proposed for my little girl, and I've consented. McCafferty left centre. Titus, Gorge, and Buzzard gather round Jolliffe and Patricia, congratulating them noisily. Congratulate you, Mr. Jolliffe. You're a lucky man, sir. Titus aside to Jolliffe. Ha, you've taken the doctor's advice then, lucky devil. Gorge and Buzzard resume their places behind table as before. Titus goes up left centre. A bell rings off right. What's that? The post, I fancy, with the London papers. She bustles off right. McCafferty crosses to Jolliffe. Ah, my boy. It's not a penniless bride ye take to your heart, for I've made up my mind to settle upon my daughter the sum of what's the amount of your bill. Takes bill from under Jolliffe's arm. Total one hundred sixty-eight pounds five ten. 
that's the exact amount i mean to settle on my daughter so to the devil with the bill throwing away bill and grasping jolliffe's hand consider you've got the money heaven prosper you music patricia enters with six london papers the london papers mccafferty takes three throws one to gorge one to titus who has dropped into chair left and sits left centre keeping remaining one patricia gives one to buzzard and one to jolliffe who brings chair and sits centre retaining one herself sitting right they all simultaneously open the papers turn them twice and begin reading greedily music mysterious and melodramatic played piano after a short pause jolliffe utters a cry of horror he looks round and seeing that no one is looking at him reads ah oh. looking round reading two hundred pound reward absconded about six weeks ago montague jolliffe fair slim about five feet ten inches in height the above reward will be paid on application to messrs screw and patchett solicitors gray's inn montague jolliffe that's my name fair i'm fair slim i am slim five feet ten inches in height that's my measure i'm a criminal i'm a criminal they all look up from their papers in astonishment what's the, what's matter? the matter what's the matter what's the matter? What's the matter music quickens beginning with patricia jolliffe goes from one to the other snatching the newspapers don't read the papers don't read the papers don't read the papers all rise in confusion. Jolliffe sinks into chair centre with newspapers under his arm. Music swells loudly as curtain falls. Quick curtain. End of Act One. Act Two of In Chancery by Arthur Wing Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two Artificial Memory Scene The best room of the hotel, at back centre a large window looking out onto Sky Prospect with the tops of some distant trees left and right. Upstage, and facing each other, doors set obliquely. Down stage right, fireplace. Before fireplace, an armchair and footstool. On the armchair, a loose cushion, under which some newspapers are concealed. A hearthrug to be raised, showing some newspapers under it. Down stage left centre, a couch. Up stage centre, a large dining table, laid for wedding breakfast with glass, plate, flowers, etc., etc. In the centre of the table, a large wedding cake, decanters of spirit, etc. Seven or eight chairs round the table. Inside door right, lock and key. Outside door left, lock and key, practicable, most important. Articles of furniture, pictures, portraits, etc., to fill spaces. See plan of scene. Mendelssohn's wedding march at Rise of Curtain. McCafferty enters door right, carrying two bottles of champagne. McCafferty is in resplendent attire, dressed in all the colours of the rainbow, and wearing a large wedding favour. He deposits the wine on the table. Oh, phew. It's a mighty good job that my little girl's not married every day of my life. What with the wedding breakfast, my wines and spirits, to say uh, nothing of supplying the bridegroom with a trousseau as well as the bride. A knock at door right. Come in now. Mr. Hinksman enters, carrying a glass of grog. 
a rather shabby-looking person, with a sharp, inquiring manner. I'm afraid I'm intruding. I'll tell ye that when I know who ye are. My name's... Checking himself. Uh, Simpson. I arrived at Steepleton late last night, having a look round on railway business. Oh, I remember ye coming. McCafferty busies himself at table. Hinksman comes down right, places Grog on mantelpiece. Got a wedding here today, I hear. My little girl's to be sacrificed. Who's the happy man? Do you mean the be maddening idiot she's wasted her young affections on? I mean the bridegroom. His name, bad luck to him, is Jolief. Mr. Montague Jolief. Hinksman starts, takes out pocketbook and makes notes. Hinksman aside. That's my man. I thought I was on the right track. To McCafferty with assumed indifference. A resident here, I suppose. No, a stranger came here from the devil knows where about a couple of months ago. Hinksman, writing again. I've got him, I've got him. Or oh, my name's not James Hinkman. And going to commit bigamy too, is he? Oh, uh, this'll make a pretty case, this will. Pockets notebook and turns as McCafferty comes down. I should like to join the wedding party, Captain McCafferty, if you've no objection. Well, you'll join it if you pay your damage. The more the wretcheder. Mr. Gorge and Mr. Buzzard bustle in at door right, gaudily dressed and wearing wedding favours. Here we are, are, Captain. Here we are. Coming centre. Here ye are, here ye are. Do you think I can't see ye? You're visible to the naked eye, I can tell you, and about an hour or two soon, both of ye. Better to sound than to light, Captain. Don't dictate to me, sir, on an anxious occasion like the present. Beg pardon, Captain. May we have a peep at the bride? Well, your daughter Amelia Anne is a dressin' of her. Goes to door and calls. Mr. Gorge and Mr. Buzzard go up and inspect the table. Patricia, Pat, come down and show yourself if you're decent. He turns and sees Gorge and Buzzard inspecting table. Mr. Gorge, Mr. Buzzard, Soars, you'll not touch the meal now till the melancholy time arrives. Patricia enters door left, attended by Amelia Ann Buzzard. Miss Buzzard is dressed in a very old maidish style, quite a contrast to Patricia. Patricia is dressed in bridal white and orange blossoms. Here I am, Papa. Here she is, gentlemen. And it's something more than parental pride when I say, mind your eyesight. To Hinksman, who is standing on hearthrug, down right. Mr. Simpson, my daughter. Hinksman bows to Patricia. And seven shillings a yard is the dress she's standing in. Oh, Pa, how can you expose me to such an ordeal? This is an unexpected pleasure, Captain McCafferty. I suppose I shall have the pleasure of making the acquaintance of Mr. Jolliffe by and by. He was sitting in the passage with his head against the wall as we come along. Then why the devil didn't ye bring him along with ye? You're the best man, aren't you? Uh, fetch him here now. Certainly, Captain, certainly. Buzzard and Gorge bustle out door right. Baba, is it commy for that we should meet? And is it commy for the father-in-law should provide the bridegroom with a trousseau to say nothing of pocket money into the bargain? Buzzard and Gorge re-enter with Jolliffe. Jolliffe is in wedding clothes, looking exceedingly anxious and unwell. He glances round wildly. Good evening. It's morning, you aggravating imbecile. Papa. It's evening if you haven't been to bed all night. Where's Dr. Titus? I wish to consult Dr. Titus. He'll be here by and by. What do ye require? I want a sleeping draught. 
I think a little nap. Seeing Buzzard on his left. What are you when the time comes? Oh, I'm the best man. Jolliffe, looking him up and down. The very best man? Buzzard nods assent. Oh, thank you. The arrangements are splendid. Seeing Gorge on right. You're the second best man, I suppose? Oh, yes, yes, I suppose so. Thank you. The arrangements are magnificent. Gorge and Buzzard both go up right of table. Jolliffe sees Hinksman. I beg pardon. I don't know you, do I? Mr. Simpson, Captain McCafferty has asked me to the wedding. How nice. Are there any more coming up? Coming centre aside. What am I going to do? I know I'm a criminal. But am I a married criminal? Oh, if only I could remember. He goes up to table, takes a decanter of spirits, and tries to pour some into glass, rattling the decanter against the glass in his agitation. McCafferty taking decanter from him. No, you'll not. You'll not touch the refreshment till the melancholy time arrives. Jolliffe and McCafferty expostulate with each other upstage. Hinksman, Dan Wright, refers to his notebook. Hinksman, aside. That's my man, all better pony. I wish I hadn't lost that there photo of Montague Jolliffe. I've wired to town for another, and must wait till it comes. But this chap answers the description. Fair, he's fair. Slim, he's slim. Five foot ten inches in height, that's about his measure. And gonna commit bigamy too, are you, Mr Jolliffe? Looking him up and down. Well, you look as if you was a gonna commit everything, Mr Jolliffe. Returns notebook to pocket. Well, I don't take my eye off you till I get that other photo from town and chance it. McCafferty coming down with Jolliffe. And there ye are, standin' shakin' like the tail of a pig. And ye haven't kissed your bride on the wedding morning. Is it behaviour? Shaking his fist at Jolliffe. I wish my state of health would permit me to lose my temper wid ye. I was about to do it. I was about to do it. Miss Buzzard and Patricia rise. Jolliffe crosses to them and distractedly embraces Miss Buzzard. Both ladies utter small screams. What are ye doing? What are ye doing? You're kissing the wrong woman. A mistake, a mistake. Kisses Patricia. Mr. Buzzard, indignantly. Kissing my daughter, Mr. Jolliffe. You forget yourself, sir. Jolliffe, throwing up his arms. I should think I do. Take him away. Take him away and put him somewhere till the time comes to make him my relative. Take him away. I'd rather explain. I, I'd rather explain. Gorge and Buzzard take hold of him on each side, and he is borne out door right, McCafferty following, gesticulating violently. Hello? This won't do. I mustn't lose sight of my man till I get that photo from town. To the ladies. Servant ladies. He goes out, door right. Patricia rises and crosses to table, centre. I'm sure Papa's too hard on Montague. It's a confusing time for him. Gentlemen aren't getting married every day of their lives. Simpering. Not to me, at any rate. At chair right. Miss Buzzard gloomily. No, nor to me either. Going to window, centre. Patricia, listening. What's that down below, dear? Miss Buzzard runs to window and looks out. Some arrivals from the railway station. A young lady with two servants, a manservant and a maid. Gracious, here's fashion. Oh, bother em. Coming here on my marriage day. And nobody to look after the kitchen but the bride. Crossing to the door. 
I hope Pa will have the good sense to shut the door on him. Come along, dear, and help me put on my veil. Yes, dear, with pleasure. Patricia goes out, door left, followed by Miss Buzzard. As they leave, the door right opens and Jolliffe re-enters stealthily, closing the door behind him. I've given my best man the slip and stolen away. If I could only reflect coherently on my position, but such a dreadful headache has come on. Crosses and sits on sofa, left centre, leaning his head on his hands. Oh, if I hadn't committed that dreadful crime, whatever it was, and knew who I was, wouldn't I make the railway company pay for this? Unperceived by Jolliffe, Hinksman returns quietly, door right. What's my man up to now? Hiding behind window curtains. If he'd only say or do something to identify himself, I'd whip him off to the magistrate in a jiffy. Jolliffe, aside. If I had sufficient courage to fly, where could I find a shelter? Even a cabman's shelter? No, Steepleton is my only chance of safety. Nobody comes to Steepleton unless they're left there by a railway accident. If I went to some busier spot, I should be arrested for that dreadful crime I've committed. Oh, how could I have done that dreadful deed, whatever it was? I wonder whether I was a hardened criminal, or only a victim of sudden temptation. Oh, I do hope I, I, I do hope I wasn't a mean thief. I should despise myself if I'd been guilty of a nasty little paltry misdemeanor. Rising. No, I hope it was a skillful, dexterous forgery, or a brilliant, audacious embezzlement. Oh, fancy, I shall never be able to write my recollections. Hinksman puts his head out from curtains. What's he muttering about? Jolliffe, sitting in armchair. And now, am I, or am I not, about to perpetrate a bigamy? Wiping his eyes. Poor Patricia. I shouldn't like to deceive her. She's a large-minded woman. Large-minded and large-hearted. Great woman altogether. No, I don't think I can be a married man. If I'd been married, I should never have committed that dreadful crime. Unless it was for the sake of a starving wife and family. Rising quickly. No, I, I must risk it. I must risk it. Marriage is my only chance of self-preservation. After the ceremony, McCafferty is bound to protect his boy, his son-in-law. Oh, the difficulty I've had to conceal the offers of reward for my apprehension. At the present moment, there are three weeks' daily papers concealed all over the hotel. He lifts up the cushion of the chair in which he has been sitting. Under the cushion, there is a quantity of newspapers. Little does old McCafferty suspect the volcano upon which he sits. Goes to Hearthrug and gingerly lifts up the corner. A heap of newspapers is strewn under the rug. McCafferty's voice is heard without. Step this way, man, and mind the stairs. McCafferty? McCafferty, is my time come? I'll go and put my head in cold water. Oh... If I could only forget to take it out again. Goes out, left door. Hinksman, coming from behind curtain. This chap's conscience is a prick in him, to judge by his antics. Looking towards door left. He can't get out of this side of the house, but I'll keep my eye on him. I'll keep my eye on him. He goes off, door left. As he leaves... McCafferty enters, followed by Mrs. Smith, John and Walker. Mrs. Smith is a young and pretty girl in an elegant travelling dress. Walker is a neatly attired, good-looking maid, and John, a very superior, smart manservant, tall, fair and slim. Walker carries some handbags and John the wraps. You'll not find a better apartment in any hotel in Europe, anywhere. Thank you, this will do. 
i am on my way to the north and wish to break the terribly long journey by remaining here to-night well you'll do as you like but take notice that the railway train will be a paradise to what this hotel will be for the next dozen hours or more good gracious what do you mean i mean that there's a wedding going on here a wedding whose wedding the wedding of my little girl with the be maddening idiot she's in love with mrs smith delighted <laughs> a wedding oh how romantic isn't it walker yes ma'am mrs smith turning to john with a sigh <sighs> fancy john a wedding yes ma'am and it's here that the gorging will be done so if you'll take my advice you'll go below while they're a-doing it mrs smith clapping her hands oh no do let me remain here and watch the festivities do mr mr o'flaherty mccafferty indignantly captain mccafferty madam captain mccafferty do let me stay i've never seen an irish wedding mccafferty beside himself an irish wedding and what's the difference between oh no none i'm sure none none uh, very well then uh, very well giving keys to walker number five number eight and number sixteen are your rooms above there are the keys the locks are out of order muttering <laughs> a irish wedding indeed to mrs smith a what name smith schmidt mrs smith mccafferty turning to go schmidt well i've never seen an italian before indignantly irish wedding indeed he goes out right banging the door after him mrs smith laughs heartily <laughs> what an extraordinary person walker run upstairs and see what my room is like john shall go to the station for the luggage yes ma'am walker places handbag on sofa and goes out door left directly she has gone mrs smith and john exchange looks then walk tiptoe mrs smith to door left john to door right they open the doors then listen for a moment then close the doors quietly then they return quickly to centre where mrs smith throws herself into john's arms oh montague 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 oh my own dear precious little wife oh montague when shall i be able to be my real self going to sofa i long to throw off this disguise and be to the world what i really am mrs montague jolliffe the wife of the dearest fellow in the world gets to john takes his hand and lays her head on his shoulder then returns to sofa oh melina darling i too long to throw aside this wretched disguise and be myself again montague joliffe the husband of the best little wife in the world but darling every newspaper day after day contains the offer of a reward for my discovery i know i know you don't think that walker my new maid suspects anything no why should she oh what a honeymoon for two young people sits on sofa <sighs> fetch the luggage from the station dear john with disgust more porters goes to door and returns to centre my honeymoon is made up of calling cabs taking tickets carrying luggage and every menial occupation under the sun and i'm worse off than a real servant oh montague i am real servants get tips i don't mrs smith rises and crosses embracing him again well then here's a tip for you my poor dear martyr mm kissing him walker enters door left unperceived by them sees them embrace and utters scream they separate in confusion ah oh, well i never oh dear oh 
dear, you... you... you came in without knocking. Really, ma'am, I must ask to leave you at once. In all my old families, the men servants have always been the maid's perquisites. Be silent. This is my husband. A lady married a man. Well, what should a lady marry? I mean a servant man. No wonder I've never had any attention from him. My good woman, I am not a manservant. I am merely assuming the character of one. And now that you are assured of that fact, you can go about your business. Mrs. Smith, going to Walker. Oh, no, Walker. Don't leave me in my great difficulties. You're a good-hearted woman, I know, and I'll confide in you. Have patience, Montague, dear. John sits in armchair, right centre. Mrs. Smith sits on cushion at his feet. Walker stands by centre with arms folded. Walker, have you ever known anybody in Chancery? Yes, ma'am, I have. My brother had a fight with a milkman. No, no. Do you know what a ward is? A sick ward, ma'am? John, dolefully. She takes us for a workhouse. Mrs. Smith, tenderly. It's only because we are a union. Yes, Walker, I am a sick ward, a heart-sick ward. Walker, I'm what they call a ward of court, one of the Lord Chancellor's young ladies, you know, and I daren't marry without the approval of the Vice-Chancellor and the consent of my trustees, Major Gamboyle and Admiral Turvey. And I have married without anybody's consent or approval at all, and, oh, Walker... They're trying to take my dear husband from me and to put him into prison to make doormats. <laughs> and we're both very young and we couldn't bear it. And, oh, Walker, how would you like it yourself? Mrs. Smith bursts into tears. John soothes and embraces her. Walker, sympathetically. Well, ma'am, of course I didn't know when I saw you kissing Master. Bless him, I've often had the mind to do it myself. Walker? Well, ma'am, I didn't know that he was your dear good husband and a gentleman, and I couldn't think of leaving you. But what will you do if they catch him? Crying. And where are you off to now, ma'am? To an old hydropathic establishment in Pitlorin, where we think no one would dream of looking for us. We tried to get there about two months ago, but we both met with a horrible shaking in a railway accident at this very junction. A shocking railway accident. We were thrown into each other's arms. Mrs. Smith to Walker. Yes, and that was not the worst of it. John to Mrs. Smith. No, dear, that was the best of it. In the collision, Mr. Jolliffe lost his overcoat and his card case. That's why we have changed our name, in case the loss should put the police on his track. There. Run along downstairs, my good walker, and see if there's any chance of our getting something to eat. Yes, ma'am, that I will. Crossing to door right. Eat. There, I feel I could swallow the master to keep him out of sight. Walker goes out door right as Hinksman enters door left, unnoticed by John and Mrs. Smith. Hinksman aside. My man's a soaking of his head. I wonder whether there's another posting from town yet. Seeing Mrs. Smith and John. Hello? More wedding guests, I suppose. Mrs. Smith, turning and seeing him. I beg your pardon? I beg yours, ma'am. I was just going downstairs to... Seeing Mrs. Smith's face, he starts back with a cry of surprise. Excuse me, ma'am. He takes out a pocket book, and out of book a photo, which he rapidly compares with Mrs. Smith's face. Right by Jingo. Yours is too pretty a face to be mistook, even when seen in a photo. Mrs. Montague Jolliffe, I'm pleased to meet you, ma'am. Mrs. Smith and John utter a suppressed cry, but otherwise retain their composure. Mrs. Smith, faintly. Who... who are you, sir? Hinksman, Mr. James Hinksman, a private inquiry officer 
in connection with Scotland Yard. I'm employed by your guardians, Major Gamboyle and Admiral Turvey, to discover the whereabouts of Mr. Montague Jolliffe, who is wanted for contempt for marrying a ward of court. John comes quickly between Mrs. Smith and Hinksman. Then let me tell you, Mr. James Hinksman, if you don't instantly quit this room, I shall take you by the scruff of the neck and break a window with you. Hello, who's this? Who am I? Mrs. Smith, grasping the situation. Oh, that, that is John Chorley, my servant. He is a very faithful fellow, but who occasionally forgets his place. Go away, John, and don't interfere. John looks from one to the other, then retires up quickly. Mrs. Smith to Hinksman. And now, sir, what do you want with me? To bring you face to face with your husband. Your following your good gentleman to Steepleton gives me the one remaining proof I wanted. And a nice little game you've caught him up to, now that you've found him. He goes up to door, laughing, and calls. Here, Mr. Jolliffe, Mr. Montague Jolliffe, you're wanted. John has come down right centre, right of Mrs. Smith. John, aside to Mrs. Smith. What? Hush, be quiet. Mr. Jolliffe, you're wanted. John, aside to Mrs. Smith. What's the meaning of this? Wait and see. You're wanted. Jolliffe, outside. Want me? Want me? Jolliffe enters slowly, door left. His hair is lank and damp, and he is mopping his forehead with his handkerchief. Yes, I've got a pleasant little surprise for you. Surprise? Yes, here's your good lady. My what? Your wife, Mrs. Montague Jolliffe, come all the way to Steepleton to find you. Hinksman pushes him over to Mrs. Smith and sits on sofa, left centre, rubbing his hands triumphantly. Jolliffe stands bewildered. My wife? My wife? Gazing at Mrs. Smith and advancing slowly. Uh, Miss, uh, Mrs. Jolliffe? Mrs. Smith, commanding herself. Mrs. Jolliffe. My wife? Pulling himself together. Had any difficulty in finding me? Inquiringly. Uh, Maria? Hinksman, rising. Maria be blowed. Look here, Mr. Jolliffe, it's no use your trying to gammon me. You'd better look things straight in the face. My name's Hinksman, and I'm a detective. I'm after you, and you know well what for. Jolliffe makes a move to Hinksman, inquiringly. What? You've married Miss Melina Summers, a ward in Chancellery, Without the consent of the court, Major Gamboyle and Admiral Turvey, the young lady's guardians, and that's the long and the short of it. Now then. Jolliffe has been listening very attentively to every word, utters a sigh of relief. Oh, that's what I've been up to. Sticks his fingers in his waistcoat and walks up and down stage beside himself with delight digging himself in the ribs. Artful devil! Gay dog! Regular Jolief! Digging Hinksman in the ribs. Hinksman remonstrates. They talk together. John, aside to Mrs. Smith. What does all this mean? The man's evidently an imposter who has taken your name to screen himself. Be silent. It may save us. Jolliffe to Hinksman. Then there's no forgery or embezzlement in the case. Well, not in my instructions. Jolliffe, indignantly. Of course there isn't, sir. You'd better be careful what you insinuate. Turning to Mrs. Smith, who is standing right centre in wonderment. Well, Melina, dear, how I have been expecting you, Melina. 
Jolliffe holds out his arm to Melina, who shrinks back, while John utters an exclamation of indignation. Be quiet. You'll betray yourself. Jolliffe, dropping his arms uneasily. Don't be annoyed, Melina. I can explain. Ha ha ha! I left you, Melina, about two months ago, wasn't it, Melina? Yes, you know it was. Goes and faces him. Yes, I know, I know it was. I tore myself from your side because I, you, we, they, you know why, Melina. Then I had a nasty accident and couldn't hold my pen. How I have missed you, Melina. Mrs. Smith, frightened but conquering herself. In, indeed. And how are things at home? Old place looking just the same? Just the same. I'm rather curious to see how the old place is looking. I, I dare say. Well, we've got ourselves into a nice scrape, haven't we, Melina? I suppose, Major... Turning to Hinksman. Gamboyle? Yes, Gamboyle and Admiral. Turning to Hinksman. Turvy. Turvy, yes, are in a frightful rage. Awful. I always hated those two old boys. Old? They're not old. Jolliffe, correcting himself hastily. No, no, no. Not when I left home. Uh, time does fly. Uh, well, I suppose they'll drag me before the vice-chancellor an inarticulate old gentleman who will read me a long lecture and incarcerate me in Holloway Prison. It will be a sad trial for you, Melina, a sad... Jolliffe puts his arm round her. She averts her head. John utters a cry of rage and turns on Jolliffe, clenching his fists. Jolliffe, looking at John. What's the matter with that fellow? Mrs. Smith, still in Jolliffe's arms. Oh, it's... it's... it's John. Oh, is it? Then what is the matter with John? Oh, he's a little subject to nervous attacks, but he's a very faithful servant. Is he? It quite slipped my memory that I had engaged John. I don't like the looks of John. I didn't like the look of him when I engaged him. John advances fiercely with clenched fists. What the? John, take a month. Take a month. John goes up, attempting to restrain his rage. Well, Melina, dear, I suppose they'll drag me away to prison. But it can't be for more than a fortnight. My previous high character will do wonders for me. Anxiously. From what you know of my past, you would consider my character rather a high one, wouldn't you, Melina? From what I know of your past... Yes. Yes, yes, yes. It will be a distressing scene when you leave me at the prison gates. But you must bear up for the sake of the little ones. Mrs. Smith starts from him with a cry. John threatening Jolliffe, and Hinksman in fits of laughter on the sofa. Ha, ha, ha. Oh, there are no little ones. No, no, uh, my mistake. A little one, perhaps? Ha, ha, ha. There is no little one. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't know. Time does fly. Goes upstage nervously. John comes down to Mrs. Smith. John, aside. I shall choke him in a minute. Jolliffe, looking round. Well, I suppose there is nothing left for us but to start back to town without delay. Are you ready, Melina? Are, are you ready? Hinksman, rising. Stop, 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 Mr. Jolly. Not so fast, if you please. There's another little matter again, you. Another little matter? Yeah, the charge of conspiring to commit a bigamous marriage with the daughter of the proprietor of this hotel. Your wife there, Melina Jolliffe, being alive. Oh... Goes up and sits left of table. Mrs. Smith, with assumed indignation. Oh! I suppose you don't know all your husband's little caperosities, Mrs. Jolliffe? With enjoyment. 
This is his wedding morning. Wedding morning number two. Looking at watch. It's almost time to set off to the church. Pointing to table. Look at the cake and... Pointing to the wedding favour in Jolliffe's coat. Look at Mr Jolliffe's wedding favour. Jolliffe hastily drags the favour from his coat and crams it into his pocket. It's all a mistake. It, it's all a mistake. I, I can explain. I have had an accident. My recollection is impaired. And when I became engaged to Miss McCafferty, I had entirely forgotten the circumstances of my marriage to this lady. What? Tell that to the Marines. I shall be happy to do so. You'll tell it to the nearest local magistrate first, for I'm a going to lodge an information again you. But I protest. Do you? Well, you are green. I may be, for all I know. I may be green, or brown, or Jones, or Robinson. Mrs. Smith, eagerly to Hinksman. Sir, is there any necessity for me and my servants to remain one moment longer in Steepleton? Well, I must prove your marriage, ma'am, either by your word or a copy of your marriage certificate. My marriage certificate? Yes, ma'am. Mrs. Smith, pointing to handbag on sofa. Please to pass me my bag. Yes, ma'am, certainly. Hinksman picks up bag and is about to pass it to Mrs. Smith when Jolliffe snatches it from him. I'll pass my wife's bag. Looking at bag, a pretty little satchel. Doubtless a little present from me. John comes in between Mrs. Smith and Jolliffe and snatches the bag from Jolliffe. John handing bag to Mrs. Smith. I'll pass the bag. Jolliffe to John, turning him round. I've given you your month. I've given you your month. Jolliffe and John go up stage, one on each side of the table, gesticulating and talking violently. Mrs. Smith takes certificate out of bag and handing it to Hinksman quickly. There you are. Now. May I go? Certainly, ma'am. Return certificate. Come, John. We will return to the station at once. John comes right centre. Jolliffe left centre. Melina, you're a heartless creature. After the risk I've run in marrying you. Is this loving, honouring and obeying? You ought to cleave to me. John, doubling his fists. I should like to cleave to you. You've got your month. Cleave to you? When in the most cold-blooded way you forget a young wife and ensnare the affections of some guileless little girl? Little girl, is she? You should just see her. Mrs. Smith, very indignantly. Monster! I trust we shall never meet again. Aside to John. You are saved, dear. John and Mrs. Smith move to door right as Walker enters. Luncheon is laid in the parlour, ma'am. We shall not require it. We are leaving the hotel at once. Good gracious, what has happened? Hush, don't say anything. Molina, Molina! <sighs> Infamous man. Mrs. Smith goes out, followed by John and Walker. Molina, leave your address. Leave our address. About to follow them when he is pulled back by Hinksman. Come, come, old fella. Don't be knocked over. A year or two in prison won't hurt an old dog like you. Jolliffe turns on him. As you say, time does fly. Knocked over? How would you like to be torn from a young wife, the one woman in the world who shares your innermost thoughts? The one woman in the world whose heart beats to yours. The one woman in the world who knows where you live. Hinksman helps himself to a glass of whiskey. Jolliffe, looking out of window. There they go. My wife and John. I don't like the look of that man's servant. He's helping my wife over a puddle. 
I don't like it. Hinksman, drinking. Now then, are you ready to make a complimentary call on the nearest J.P.? What do you mean? J.P.? Jolly publican? Nah, justice of the peace. No, sir, I'm not ready. If I get two years, how shall I know that John leaves at the end of the month? Hinksman, growing impatient. Oh, I don't know. Now come along quietly. Oh, what a dreadful scene there will be downstairs between my best man and old McCafferty. Well, say we're just a going to set out to the church, you see. I'm your best friend. Now, are you ready? Jolliffe, sinking into chair left of table. Oh, my head's come on so bad again. Has it? Looking at table, C. Champagne takes it up. Here, have a drop of this. Don't, Mr. Hinksman. Think of McCafferty. Hinksman, opening bottle. We will think of McCafferty. We'll drink his health. He fills two glasses, gives one to Jolliffe, and takes the other himself. Hinksman, draining his glass at a gulp. Here's a husband to Miss McCafferty. Poor Patricia. She won't think at all highly of me. What a blow. What a blow. Hinksman, refilling his glass. Well, she wouldn't have liked to marry a married man now, would she? Draining glass. Jolliffe, sipping his wine. I don't know. Patricia is a large-minded woman. Large-minded and large-hearted. Great woman altogether. Hinksman, pouring himself out another glass. Little too dry, this wine. Must try another. Begins opening another bottle. McCafferty will kill those best men. I do wish Patricia could have seen Melina. Melina proves what perfect taste I've got. Patricia ought to esteem it a compliment, my proposing to her when I possess such a beautiful girl in Melina. Hinksman, having opened the bottle, fills his glass and drinks. That's better, that's sweeter. Replenishes glass ad lib. Jolliffe to himself. Titus is a humbug. I didn't recognize Melina at all. He said the sight of a familiar face or sound of a familiar voice would bring my memory back suddenly. And then... Hinksman, swaying about with bottle and glass in hand. Look after yourself, old boy. Jolliffe, aside. That's familiar enough, at any rate. Hinksman, swaying a little with fixed look, slowly and to himself. They may say what they like, but there's no society so instructive or so entertaining as the criminal classes. Pointing bottle at Jolliffe. Jolliffe, indignantly. Criminal classes. I believe he's getting intoxicated. Hinksman sinks back into chair, right of table. Getting? He's got. Hinksman, muttering to himself in a dreamy, drunken manner. I wish I could have forty winks before we start. Jolliffe, excitedly. If I could only give him the slip and make my escape. He takes decanter and sniffs it. Whiskey, Irish. Have another drain, Mr. Hicksman? Jolliffe pours champagne and whiskey into Hinksman's glass. Thanks, old fella. Drinks and coughs, smacking his lips. That's better. There's more body in that. Jolliffe refills Hinksman's glass. Hinksman drinks again. More body, more head. Drink it up, Mr. Hicksman. Hinksman drinks it up, rising unsteadily. I'm going, I'm going. I'm not going to waste my time any longer. Time's money, I'm going. Falls back into chair. I'm going. Drops his head gradually on table. Going, going. Falls fast asleep. Gone. Now for it. Looking out of window. There they are still, my wife and John. I'll soon put a stop to that. Goes to door right. No, I daren't go that way. 
My best man and McCafferty are below. I have it. My bedroom is above this, and my portmanteau is in there ready packed for the honeymoon. I'll lower it out of the window, and myself after it. Proudly. I shall return to Molina with everything brand new. Feeling in his pocket. Half a sovereign, given me by McCafferty, with strict injunction not to change it. What a position. Two hundred pounds on my head, and nothing in my pocket. He is going to door left when Patricia enters, followed by Miss Buzzard. Oh, Montague, why haven't you set off for the church? The time's come, dear. You'll be late for me. I was just going to give a finishing touch to my hair. The door right opens and McCafferty enters, followed by Titus, Gorge and Buzzard, and they are all carrying their hats and gloves. Jolliffe goes down right. Jolliffe aside. Surrounded, surrounded. There he is, there he is Captain, Captain there, he is. there he is. They all form up in front of where Hinksman is sitting to cover him. Hinksman falls under table. What do ye mean by skulking about here, when it's time to be off? I was just thinking about being off. Upon my soul, I was. McCafferty pointing to Patricia, who is sitting left centre with Miss Buzzard. Now there's a dazzling sight for any man on his wedding morning, with the colour of her hair just breaking through her veil, for all the world like the sun under a cloud. The men turn to Patricia with a polite murmur of admiration, while Jolliffe, unperceived, goes hastily to door right, locks it, and slips the key in his pocket. Mr. Gorge, Titus, and Mr. Buzzard, looking at Patricia. Quite a vision. Beautiful. Charming picture. Jolliffe, aside. Locked. They can't follow me. McCafferty turning to Jolliffe. And what have ye got to say to her? Jolliffe, down right. Oh, I'm not worthy of your daughter. She's too beautiful, too good. Very well, then. Get your hat and gloves and come with me. My hat and gloves, uh, they're upstairs. Crossing rapidly to left. I'll fetch him, I'll fetch him, I'll fetch him. Aside. Free, free! He goes out, door left. He closes the door sharply and is heard to turn the key in the lock outside. What's that? What the devil are you locking the door for? Going to it and rattling the handle. Open it, do you hear me? Titus, going to door right, tries it. Why, this is locked too. McCafferty, crossing to left centre. That locked too? Then there's some treason going on. Hinksman, who is under the table, is heard muttering. What's this? Where am I? Hark! Where's Jolliffe? Two hundred pound reward. Where's Jolliffe? McCafferty lifts up the tablecloth. Hinksman is discovered. Mr. Simpson! Hinksman rises unsteadily. No, no, my name's Hinksman. I'm a detective. I'm after Montague Jolliffe. He's wanted. Wanted? 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 I should think he was. I want him. Hinksman, trying to collect his thoughts. On two charges, running away with a ward in Chancery. What? 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 Second, conspiring to commit a bigamous marriage with... Sees Patricia. This lady is wife being alive. Oh. He's given me the slip. Where is he? Hinksman makes a rush downright. Is stopped by Titus. We can't get out. We're on the first floor and he's locked us in. A knock is heard outside. Hark! Hark! Hark. Jolliffe, outside. Gentlemen! Gentlemen, can you hear me? There is a cry of rage from everybody. Patricia and Miss Buzzard cross quickly to right. All the characters form an oblique line from right to door left, beginning with Miss Buzzard down right, next Titus, Patricia, Gorge, Buzzard, Hinksman, finishing up with McCafferty. 
Gentlemen, I am sorry that some unexpected complications in my domestic arrangements will prevent my fulfilling my contract with Miss McCafferty. Oh. Oh, Scorpion. <sighs> I am terminating my connection with the town of Steepleton, taking with me my marriage outfit, for which I will repay the captain at the earliest opportunity. Oh, oh, the Scorpion, the trousseau I gave him. Become, 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 become. Uh, Captain McCafferty, be calm. I am now on my way to catch a train, but I will hand the keys of this room to the station master before I start. He will release you. Patricia, farewell. Captain McCafferty and gentlemen, farewell. Music. The line of characters breaks up. McCafferty throws up his arms. Hinksman goes to door left and tries to open it. The villain. The villain, I'll be the end of him. Patricia, rushing to McCafferty. The shock will kill my pa. Be calm. calm. The scoundrel can't get out of this side of the house. We'll break the door down. Come on. Captain McCafferty, think of the bullet. Bullet to be damned. It's good for me. Come on. Patricia, falling back right centre. Oh, pa, look. They all turn. Outside the window, a knotted sheet with large new portmanteau attached is seen to descend. Begora, the trousseau I gave him. The portmanteau disappears. Then Jolliffe is seen lowering himself. Patricia sinks on her knees in the centre of the stage. McCafferty, Gorge and Buzzard and Hinksman with cries of execration. The music swells as the curtain falls. End of Act Two Act Three of In Chancery by Arthur Wing Pinero This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Act Three Home Sweet Home Scene. Room comfortably furnished in lodging-house fashion. Centre at back, a fireplace. At back left, a door. Downstage left, a window practicable. Downstage right, a door. Right centre, a couch. Behind couch, a small table, on which stands a terracotta bust. Upstage right, set across the corner of the room, a piano and piano stool piano open, behind piano, out of sight, a stool or chair for business, before fireplace an armchair, a mantelpiece, framed photograph of actor playing Jolliffe, a quantity of letters stuck in chimney glass, downstage left centre a table and two chairs, good lamp lighted, landscape picture hung on wall right, other pictures, furniture, ornaments, etc., etc., to fill spaces. Nighttime, blue gas row, or lime, outside window. Music at rise of curtain, home sweet home. Kittles, a servant girl, is discovered placing a lighted lamp on table, left centre. Where's Mrs., I wonder? In her own room a morning over the dear departed, I suppose. Looking towards window. Hello, that won't do. A bill's got topsy turvy. Goes to window and turns bill. Apartments for ladies and gentlemen upside down. That ain't the way to fill our establishment. Mrs. Jackson enters right. She is a comely woman in widow's weeds. What are you doing, Kittles? Kittles, showing bill. Apartments for ladies and gentlemen upside down. What? A bill's got topsy-turvy. Oh. Kittles readjusts Bill. It doesn't matter much. I shall never let my rooms in this dead and alive place. Excuse me, Mum, but I don't think as how you goes houtin' about enough. 
you ain't been to Rosherville Gardens not once since I've been with you. Gravesend is the gayest place I've ever lived in. Have you ever been out of it, Kittles? Kittles, proudly. No, Mum, never. I was born and educated here. <sighs> it will drive me mad. Comes to couch and sits. You know, Kittles, I lost my husband some two months ago. Yes, Mum, I've heard you mention it. My income being very small, I was obliged to look round for some means to add to it. This house was advertised as being splendidly adapted for the letting of apartments, and the landlord described it as Brighton on Thames. I brought my furniture from London three weeks ago, and here I am. The house is splendidly adapted for the letting of apartments, which nobody seems to take. <laughs> I suppose the best visitors sleep in the open air. Oh, do cheer up, Mum. When the people do come, they'll come in shoals like the shrimps, and then you'll be able to catch them alive and boil them. Ah, go away, Kittles. You're vulgar. Yes, Mum. Going to door left and turning. Oh, Mum, excuse me, Mum, but I only wish as how I was a widow. Good gracious. Why? Oh, cause it seems so much more easy to get a husband when you're a widow. Mrs. Jackson rises. Kittles coming down to window. Hark, Mum, there. Blessed if there ain't a fly with some luggage at our door. Three people inside and one out. They can't be coming to this house. Kittles opening window. Oh, can't they, though? There's a gentleman getting off the box. Mrs. Jackson in a hurry. Show them in here, while I run and make myself neat. Be quick, Kittles. Kittles, excitedly. Yes, Mum. I told you so, Mum. I told you so. The shrimps has come, the shrimps has come. Bustles off, door left. Mrs. Jackson, looking in chimney glass. Oh, I suppose they'll only ask the rent and drive away. But I think I'd better go curl my fringe in case. Mrs. Jackson runs out, door right. A murmur of female voices is heard off left. Then Kittles enters. This way, ma'am. This way, ma'am, if you please. Aside. Oh, crikey, what swells! Kittles, right of door, comes down left. Mrs. Smith enters, followed by Walker and John. Walker carries her mistress's plush bag. John has the wraps and a bag or two. Oh! How weary I am. Do sit down, ma'am. There. There's a dear. Walker places Mrs. Smith upon couch right centre, then takes smelling salts from bag and holds them to her nose. Thank you, Walker. Looking round. This is melancholy enough. Aside to Walker. But it's better than another dreadful hotel. She leans back wearily and closes her eyes. John to Kittles. Oh, you let apartments here, don't you? Crossing his leg and leaning on table. Kittles, looking him up and down and imitating him. Yars. Aside. Oh, crikey, here's a tip-top valet. John, looking round. This is the sitting room, I suppose. Sitting room for the master and the missus, standing room for the domestics. John, looking at her with disgust. What other rooms are there? Well, I lives in the kitchen. I don't want to know where. Thought you might like to pay me a visit, Thomas. Girl. Walker to Kittles. You mustn't speak to Mr... Uh, to John in that way. Oh, I beg's pardon, I'm sure. I wasn't aware as how you monopolised of him. He won't break, I suppose. She digs John in the ribs. Walker and John move away right centre indignantly as Jolliffe is heard without. John! John! Kittles, aside. Here's the master, I expect. Jolliffe enters. He wears a white hat and one brown and one white kid glove. Melina, I am ignored. Sits left centre. I don't know whether it's with your sanction and approval, but I'm ignored. John, aside to Melina. Melina, 
when are we to shake off this lunatic? Mrs. Smith to John. Have patience, Montague. He's our safeguard. If the detective is on our track again, we still have the wrong man ready for him instead of the right one. Jolliffe takes off his hat and is about to put it on the table when he catches sight of Kittles, who is laughing and covering her mouth with her apron. Jolliffe, drawing his hat back and looking at Kittles. What's the matter? What is the matter? Kittles pulls herself together, then laughs again. The attendance in these apartments is most unsatisfactory. Holding out his hat to John. John? No notice is taken. John, my hat. John looks at him savagely, then turns away again. John, you can take. Oh. Checking himself. Oh, yes, I did give you your month this morning. He puts his hat under the chair, then sneezes. Uh, Melina, I don't wish you to reproach yourself, but my cold arises from your having requested me to ride on the box seat. Taking his gloves off, sees that they are odd. This comes of leaving one's hotel in a hurry. Kittles goes to door left. What is the name of the girl here? Kittles, mum. Kittles, tell your mistress I am waiting to see the apartments. Yes. Mum, I fancy missus is a puffin of her face. Kittles crosses to door right, then looks round and laughs at Jolliffe loudly. Here, hi, you. What's your name, Kittles? Yes, sir. My compliments to your mistress, and I request that she gives you your month. Oh, go along. Bounces off door right. Jolliffe rises and looks about the room inquiringly. Jolliffe, glancing out of window. John, it has doubtless escaped your memory that my portmanteau, my new portmanteau, still remains on the top of the cab in the night air. John, advancing. Well... Well, fetch it. John, biting his lips. I shall not. Mrs. Smith, rising. John. You would see me do that myself? Yes. You would see me lug that weighty portmanteau off that cab, up those stairs into this house? Yes, I would. If you watch through that window, you will do so. He goes out, door left. John sits left-centre with a sigh of disgust. Walker, look the other way and don't listen. Runs over to John, kneels at his feet and kisses him. My poor vexed Montague. Walker sits upstage in armchair. Now they're going to spoon. <laughs> spoon? They don't spoon. They positively ladle. Melina, this fellow is in... Horrible. Kicks against Jolliffe's hat. What's this? Why, if it isn't that infernal fellow's hat, out it goes. Picks it up between his thumb and fingers and flings it out of the open window. I say that fellow is intolerable. Ever since he jumped wildly into our carriage just as the train was leaving Steepleton, we have never been alert for one moment. What plan have you got in your little head now? Why have we come here? Why, listen, you foolish fellow. You know I have an uncle at Colombo. Well, that isn't here. No, but the P&O boat, the Siam, starts from this place for Colombo on Wednesday at noon, and I propose that we take refuge with my uncle till our chancery affair has blown over. Colombo? That's a long way from the club, Melina. Yes, and from Holloway, too. Rising. John, rising. But I don't see why we should be bothered with this mendacious scoundrel. I've told you, the man is under the strange hallucination that he is Mr. Montague Jolliffe, and my husband. Confound him. On Wednesday we give him the slip and start for Colombo. But if in the meantime Mr. Hinksman follows us here, this unfortunate person is locked up and you escape. Yes, I see that. I'm very sorry for him, but we're two and he is only one, and the minority must always suffer for the majority. 
Hush. Jolliffe enters door left, struggling under the weight of his portmanteau, and with his white hat much crushed upon his head. Walker rises. Jolliffe deposits portmanteau upstage left centre, then comes down and looks under the chair left centre. Jolliffe taking off his hat. It was my hat I found on the railings. He replaces hat under chair and sits as Kettles enters door right. Mrs. is tidy, ma'am. Will you please to step this way? Thank you. John, bring the luggage. Kittles goes out, followed by Mrs. Smith and Walker. Walker, as she goes out, looks at Jolliffe and bursts into laughter. Hi, you. Thingamy, what's your name? <laughs> Walker. No repartee, if you please. Lucy Adelaide Walker. Oh, I beg pardon. Then Lucy Adelaide Walker, from tonight... Looking at watch. At 9.30, you will take a month. Huh. She flounces out. John has gathered up the wraps, which he has previously deposited by the piano, and is going out whistling. Jolliffe rising. John, unstrap my portmanteau and take out my slippers. John? John pauses at door, turning furiously. Uh, John, you can leave my portmanteau alone. Don't touch it. John goes out contemptuously. Jolliffe triumphantly. That's the first time I ever knew that fellow obey my instructions. Soft music, as in first act. Jolliffe looks round. I don't know what Molina's arrangements are, but I think I shall be very comfortable. I'm beginning to get a little tired of Molina's airs and graces. I wish I could remember what induced me to marry such a disagreeable girl as Molina. Sits on couch, right centre. Oh, the events of this day, no diary that was ever kept has a page large enough to crawl. His eye rests on the little bust on table, right centre. He starts, falters, and moves uneasily, and takes the bust in his hand. I know that bust. I've seen that bust before, often, and often, before I forgot how to remember. Titus said that all of a sudden... He replaces the bust quickly, and edges away from it. My head's come on so bad again. That bust has started it. Beastly bust. He sits. What I was reflecting upon was that it would take a very large diary to... To... His gaze becomes riveted on the lamp on table, left centre. He moves uneasily. I've seen that lamp before. The pattern on that lamp is quite familiar. He starts up and edges away to centre. He wipes his forehead nervously. Titus never said I should have these sensations. This isn't the sight of somebody's ugly face, or the melody of a miserable comic song, or the... or... Catches sight of little landscape on wall, right. I've seen that picture before. I painted that picture when I was a little boy at Dr. Brown's school in Chelsea. Goes round the room, quickly identifying the various objects. I know that, and that, and that. I... He sees a framed photo upon the mantelpiece. I know that man. Snatching the photo. I've seen that man before. This is the ugly face Dr. Titus spoke about. Runs down left centre to get the light of the lamp. No, it isn't. It's my portrait. What's the meaning of this? What is my portrait doing here? He is at the mantelpiece again. He sees the letters stuck in the chimney glass. He snatches some of them down and stares at them wildly, reading the addresses. Mr. Jackson? Mr. Marmaduke Jackson? Marmaduke Jackson, Esquire? Jackson. Jackson? That's my name. My name's Jackson. These letters are from me. Opens letters violently, throwing them aside as he sees their contents. Income tax. Titus was right. Titus was right. 
Bootmaker, tailor, my tailor's bill. He kisses the bill wildly as Mrs. Jackson is heard without. I'm sure you'll be pleased, sure you'll be pleased. Jolliffe, starting and listening. I know that voice. I know that voice. Mrs. Jackson enters right. That's my wife. Mrs. Jackson, with a scream. Marmaduke, come back. Emily. Marmy. They rush into each other's arms. Music ceases. Oh, Marmaduke, where have you been? I thought I was a widow. Wiping her eyes. And I thought I was. Well, I don't know what I thought I was. But I'll tell you all about myself in a minute. Rapidly. So you've moved from Brixton, Emily. Mrs. Jackson, delighted. Yes, dear. Your employers were very good to me. My employers? Uh, Griggs and Barber, candle makers. I'm their traveller, bless them. With a start. Emily, Emily, how's little Freddy? Beautiful. He's in bed. Marmaduke, how have you got on for undervests? Lovely. Don't wear them. How's Aunt Matilda? Glorious. Oh, Emily, Emily. Oh, Marmy. They sit together on couch. He leans his head on her shoulder. Oh, I'm so glad to get home. Mrs. Jackson, drying her eyes and putting her handkerchief away. And now, Marmaduke, I shall be obliged to you if you will give me some account of your proceedings. <coughs> um, certainly, my dear. I am delighted to see my husband again, of course. If that husband is an honourable, decent, respectable person. You remember what I am, Marmaduke, an affectionate but jealous, determined woman. I'm not to be trifled with. Clenching her fists. And if I find that you've been up to any... But I anticipate, anticipate. Jolliffe, dampened. Yes, Emily, you do. Mrs. Jackson, firmly. Now you left me about two months ago. To go to Dilchester with my samples. Suddenly. I wonder what became of those samples. Never mind the samples. Go on. At Steepleton Junction, there was a railway collision. I was the only victim. Oh! I was carried to the hotel near at hand, and... Suddenly. How's Uncle Robert? <laughs> Never mind. Uncle Robert will keep. Jolliffe, injured. Oh, I should hope so, Emily. I say, I was carried to the hotel near at hand, and I suppose in the confusion another man's overcoat and another man's card case were carried with me. Well, what of that? I'm telling you, Emily, I'm telling you. Now here comes the strange part of my story. When I recovered, I recovered everything but my memory. What? I had not the slightest recollection of the past. You, little Freddy, Griggs and Barber, Aunt Matilda and Uncle Robert, everything and everybody had gone from my memory. In fact, I was compelled to embark in an entirely fresh career. Mrs. Jackson, quickly. Just as if you were a single, unencumbered man? Jolliffe, leaning back beamingly. Yes. Mrs. Jackson, starting up, clenching her hands. Marmaduke! Jolliffe, rising. My dear. Mrs. Jackson, in an awful voice. Tell that to the Marines! Emily! Tell that to the Marines! I have once today expressed my willingness to do so. Mrs. Jackson, following him. Oh, bash! Jolliffe, horrified. Emily, you don't mean to say you doubt my... I don't believe a syllable of it. But I... Mrs. Jackson, struck with a sudden thought. Ah, uh, you didn't know when you came here that I was the proprietor of this house? Of course I didn't. Of course you didn't. Mr. Jackson, who is this lady you have brought to reside in these apartments? Jolliffe, wiping the perspiration from his brow. The young lady? The young lady with the two servants. 
Oh, the young lady with the two servants? Who is she? Yes, who is she? What is she? What is she? Yes, the young lady with the two servants. Attempting to change the subject. You're not keeping anything concerning Uncle Robert from me, are you, Emily? Mrs. Jackson, dumping her foot. How does that woman come here? I'm telling you, Emily, I'm telling you. She was coming in as I was coming in. We were both coming in together. I didn't even notice the young lady was a woman. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I don't know. She told me I should find her husband in this room. Where is he? Jonathan staggers against the chair. Her husband? Her husband. Where is he? Jonathan looks round uneasily. I don't see him for the moment. Don't, don't see him for the moment. Mrs. Smith is heard without. Unpack my bag, Walker. Here she is. I'll ask her. Jolliffe, in agony. I shouldn't. Family matters, family matters. Mrs. Jackson goes to door right and throws it open. Jolliffe darts to left centre for his hat. Mrs. Jackson returns to him quickly and takes him by the collar. Where are you going? Can't make out what became of those samples going to inquire. You'll remain here while I put a few questions to the lady who happened to be coming in just as you were coming in here. She drags him upstage and pushes him behind the piano, his head appearing over top. Emily! If you attempt to stir or utter a sound, I'll... Let me explain. Hush! Here she comes. Mrs. Jackson pushes the armchair against the end of piano so that he cannot make his escape and comes down centre as Mrs. Smith enters door right. I've no doubt I shall be very comfortable. Thank you, Mrs. Jackson. Crosses and sits right of left table. I'm sure I hope so. Mrs. Smith sitting left centre. And I don't think I need trouble you to remain. Mrs. Jackson, sitting right centre. It's no trouble, I assure you. <sighs> A talkative landlady. You will excuse me, but uh, I understood you to say I should find your husband in this room? I certainly left him here a few minutes ago. He must have gone out. Gone out? Jolliffe tries to attract Mrs. Jackson's attention. Mrs. Jackson motions him to be quiet. You seem to be a very young wife. May I ask how long you've been married? Mrs. Smith, impatiently. Oh, I was married about two months ago. Mrs. Jackson starts up. Oh, heavens! The very time he left me! Mrs. Jackson waves her hand to him to hide himself. Mrs. Jackson reseating herself to Mrs. Smith. You are quite contented and happy, I hope? Fairly so. When you see my husband, you will guess from his appearance and manners that I have married much beneath me. Jolliffe rises and glares fiercely at Mrs. Smith. Attracted for the moment, I suppose, by some fascinating showy young gentleman? Hardly so. Is he fair or dark? Fair. With a small scar on the lobe of his left ear? <laughs> really, I have never noticed. Never noticed? Madame, perhaps I can show it to you. Jolliffe, in desperation, is attempting to get over the top of the piano. In doing so, he slips and falls on the keyboard. Both ladies turn. Mrs. Smith rises. Mrs. Jackson turns to Jolliffe and points to him. Is that the gentleman? That is the person. Mrs. Jackson runs to Jolliffe and brings him down. Madame, this man is my husband. Your husband? No. To Jolliffe. What is your name? J J Jackson. It wasn't Jackson this morning. Melina, don't rake up the past. We're both older and wiser since the morning. 
Time does fly. The door left opens suddenly and Hinksman enters. Hinksman, breathlessly. Uh, Hello. Caught you again, have I? Who are you? Hinksman. (gasps) The detective. Nice job you gave me. But we took the next train, though. All of us. Jolliffe recoils. All of you? How many? Hinksman, mopping his head. Captain McCafferty. Oh. Dr. Titus. Oh. Miss Patricia. Patricia. Oh, oh, oh. Patricia? Who is she? Why, the lady this gentleman was a going to marry this morning. Mrs. Jackson to Jolliffe. What? Another? To Hinksman. Sir, this man is my husband. Hinksman with a chuckle. Your husband too. Why, the gentleman's a Mormon. Sits at table and makes notes in book. What shall I do? Poor Montague will be taken. Seizing Jolliffe on his right. He is my husband. He said so this morning. Mrs. Jackson, pulling Jolliffe from the other side. He's my husband. He'd say anything. He's Mr. Jolliffe. He's Mr. Jackson. He's Mr. Jolliffe. He's Mr. Jackson. The two women pull Jolliffe from one side to the other. Jolliffe appealingly. Ladies, ladies, don't divide on this question. Mr. Hexman, don't let them. Mrs. Jackson goes up back. McCafferty enters, carrying a large pistol case. Is the scandal here? I should think he was. McCafferty deposits pistol case on table. And alive, too, and alive. Only just, oh, only just. McCafferty going down to Jolliffe. I've brought my pistol with me, the same as I fought Colonel Doherty with years ago. Oh. Mrs. Smith, aside. I must warn Montague. Perhaps in the confusion he may escape. She slips out, door right. Now you'll cross the water with me and satisfy my honor with your blood. Can't get away. Can't get away just now, my busy time. You thought to do for me with the shock of your departure. But ye see, I'm one too many for ye. Everybody's one too many for me. Goes up to Portmanteau and brings it down to McCafferty. Here, take back the wedding trousseau. It's unworn. Take back the pocket money. It's unchanged. Putting half sovereign on Portmanteau, which McCafferty picks up eagerly. Your bill shall be settled. Yes, when I've settled you, or you've settled me. If you'll not fight in a foreign country, ye shall fight me here. You've got one bullet in you already. Greedy, greedy. Goes down right. Mrs. Jackson, coming down to McCafferty's right. How dare you incite my husband to commit a breach of the peace? Your husband? My husband. Ha ha ha, Bagora! It's not bigamy, but trigonometry he's attempting. Whatever his faults, he's the father of little Freddy, sleeping quietly in his cot at this moment. And am I not the father of my little Patricia, who ought to be sleeping quietly in her cot at the moment? The door opens and Patricia enters with Titus. Patricia is still in her bridal attire. Jolliffe hides himself behind Mrs. Jackson. McCafferty embracing Patricia. Ah, oh, my daughter. There stands the viper. Patricia to Jolliffe. Montague, come here. She crosses centre. McCafferty goes down left, sits back of table. Hinksman goes up back. Go away! Go away! Go away! I'm engaged too deep. Mrs. Smith enters, door right followed by John. You shan't touch him. He belongs to me. Uh, He doesn't. He belongs to me. Jolliffe to Mrs. Smith. Molina, I'm ashamed of you. He belongs to me. 
I've written on his heart the story of my young love. Goes left of table. McCafferty sits back of table. Hinksman coming down right of Jolliffe. Come, come, ladies. There seems to be some little misunderstanding. Think so? Now, my good fellow, explain. I have explained, and I'll do so again if you'll only produce those wretched marines. My name is Jackson. I am the devoted husband of this devoted lady. Titus comes down between Hinksman and Jolliffe. Titus, handing two letters to Hinksman. Oh, Mr. Hinksman, these two letters for you arrived at the hotel as we left it. I'd quite forgotten to give them to you. Hinksman takes letters and opens them, goes right. Jolliffe to Titus. A nice thing you've done. This comes of taking your prescription. I told you to take it easy. You've done so. It's brought you home to you. It has brought it home to me. Titus and Jolliffe go up. Hinksman takes photo out of first letter. Hello? What's this? Why, it's the photo of the missing Montague Jolliffe. To Jolliffe, looking at him. Why, it's not like you at all. Slapping his forehead. Where have I seen this fizz now? Mrs Smith, covering her husband's face with her hands. Oh, it isn't like John. It isn't like John. Hinksman, turning. Why, that's the man. Well, you are an artful couple. Mrs Smith, embracing John. Oh, Montague, Montague. Hinksman opens second letter. Jolliffe to John. I'm sorry for you, John. The judge will give you more than a month. And you more than a year. No recrimination, if you please. Well, this is spoiling a good job. And no mistake. A letter from Screw and Patchett, Mr. Jolliffe. Reading. Admiral Turvey and Major Gamboyle, having received a most excellent account of the young gentleman who has married their ward, Miss Melina Summers, desire to withdraw from all action in the matter, and are bringing every influence to bear upon the vice-chancellor to induce him to inflict a merely nominal punishment. The affair is therefore to be hushed up. Oh, Montague! Melina, then everything is settled? Yeah, everything settled. Throwing away letter. Everything settled. Hinksman. Crossing to Jolliffe and saying sharply, Oh no, you're not settled yet, Mr. Jackson. You are still wanted for attempting to marry Miss McCafferty. Can't be. That lady, pointing to Mrs. Smith, is not my wife. Can be. Pointing to Mrs. Jackson. That lady is your wife. Oh, oh, how intricate the law is. Retires upstage. Titus, coming down left. Stop a minute. The charge against this gentleman depends a little on Miss McCafferty. To Patricia. Patricia, we've known each other for a long time. Will you marry me? Patricia, crosses left, embracing Titus. Yes, anybody. McCafferty, coming down. What about my consent? My dear Captain, think. You'll always have me near you to watch for the bullet. Devil take the bullet. The little drop of whiskey I drink is so good and so strong. I believe the bullet's melted long ago. Mr. Hinksman, this lady declines to prosecute. And I can assure Mrs. Jackson, in any court of law, that Mr. Jackson's strange behavior was solely caused by his railway accident at Steepleton Junction. You hear, Emily? Do you believe me? <sighs> I suppose I must. She believes me. To Hinksman. We shall not require those marines. Embracing Mrs. Jackson. <laughs> Every married man will be trying to meet with a railway accident now. I shan't. I shall give up travelling for Griggs and Barber, and if I take a drive into the country, you shall accompany me. To Melina. I shall never forget you, Melina. Glaring at John. I shan't forget you, John. To Hinksman. 
I shan't forget you in a hurry. Hinksman laughs to McCafferty. I wish I could forget you. Oh, by the way, I find I was a commercial traveler, so I shall require two and a half percent off that little account. McCafferty, with disgust. Bah! Jolliffe, crossing to Patricia and shaking her hand. I shall always remember my kind nurse, Mrs. Titus, that is to be. To Titus. And doctor, your bill shan't slip my memory. Looking round. In fact, I'm never going to forget anything or anybody any more. To audience. And last, but not least, I shall never forget you. Music as curtain falls. The end. End of Act 3. End of Enchantry by Arthur Wing Pinero.